I'm a numbers girl. Maths always came easily to me. Um, numbers make sense to me. Um, actually, numbers for me tell a story. So I was one of those annoying children who, um, right through primary school, was first in class. Um, and most of the time with over 90% in maths. And actually, unlike some of our parents who like to claim that, I do have the audit evidence to prove that. So I went through primary school, did pretty well, top 10 in Nairobi, and I went to that grand old school in Kikuyu that you all love to hate. Now, after first form, first term, um, discovering that everyone else was actually quite clever, um, I settled and continued to excel in maths and in sciences, I guess a testament to my logical brain. So once again, I did pretty well in my O levels. And in the absence of good career advice at the time, I thought I was going to be a doctor because I guess that's what everyone else thought I would do. So I took maths, chemistry, biology as my A-level subjects. But I found out that first of all, A-levels were much harder than I imagined they would be. Um, and by the end of sixth form, I really hated biology and the feeling was mutual. So I guess for the first time, for my A-levels, I didn't do well. Or rather, let's just say I didn't do great. So I still made it into university. I did Bachelor of Education, Maths and Chemistry, and I was still at sea about what my career path would be. Then in between second and third year, at the suggestion of a friend of a friend, I interned at a leading professional services firm. And despite my pretty close to zero accounting knowledge at the time, they asked me to come back after third year. Now, it was a really steep learning curve, um, but I guess because Numbers I and I were good friends in the first place, accounting has really worked for me and the rest, as they say, is history. Now, there's no doubt in my mind at all that all that I've been able to do came through a solid foundation. Um, the love and support of my parents was unquestionable. So let me tell you a little bit about them. I'll start with my dad. We like to call him Brig. Um, so you see, he was in the army and many people assumed that the different ranks that they had were actually their names. So we'd have... Um, well, his last rank uh, before he retired was Brigadier General, which is shortened as Brig. And so we'd actually have invitations addressed to Mr. and Mrs. Brig. <laughs> what did I get from my dad? Um, from him, I got a real sense of order and discipline, a proper general's daughter. But I also loved the contrast between the fact that he was this really serious guy at work, but at home he'd be the one who chases us and if he catches you, he's really going to tickle your feet. When I started to travel a lot for work, um, I had to give him a very detailed itinerary of where I was going, what time I was taking off, what time the flight would land, if there are any layovers, how long those layovers were. I mean, meticulous detail about my whole plan. Now, in addition to that, he'd also crack some nice dry dad jokes where he'd ask, um, so you're going to Kigali, say hi to Kagame. You're going to, Museveni, to Kampala, say hi to Museveni. And if you're going to London, say hi to the queen. So <laughs> almost without exception, when I'd land in Nairobi, I'd be going down the stairs um, of the plane and I'd get a call. And he'd ask, have you landed? I'm like, yes. So why haven't you called? I'm like, Daddy, I'm actually just going down the steps now. Um, did you say hi to the queen? I'm like, yes, of course I did. Uh, <laughs> my dad was in military intelligence, so I still have a bit of a suspicion about the timing of that call. But anyway. <sighs> my dad passed on five years ago. And I'll tell you that my first flights soon after that, were really difficult. I guess I used to take that call for granted, but it was really hard. I still struggle to, to talk about him in, in past tense. Hmm. Then there's my mom. As you might have guessed, her name is Mama Anne. Um, my mom gave us unconditional love. There's no point at which 
uh, we ever doubted that we were loved. And in addition, uh, she gave us a voice. We were allowed to ask questions, we had opinions, and we were able to have healthy, robust discussions. Now, everybody loves Mama Anne. She's just those people, and she loves them right back. Um, she was those moms who made freshly squeezed juice. There's no packet juice in our house. Um, nutritious, delicious meals, and the best cake ever. In addition, uh, when my dad had retired, he used to carry food um, for lunch. And so after dinner, she'd actually go and cook a fresh meal so that he doesn't carry what we just ate for dinner. Who, who does that? Anyway, let's just say that that gene missed me completely. But even though um, she didn't manage to pass on that gene, she did um, give me lots of support and encouragement as I started my own family. I got married and got two kids in quick su succession. So if you remember that family planning poster that shows you what not to do, which has a pregnant woman holding a little toddler, that was me. So of course there were some three, four years that were a bit of a blur. I didn't know whether I was coming or going. Um, here I was trying to figure out uh, how to excel at work, how to be a good mom, what is good wifelyhood, what the hell is going on. But anyway, in the middle of all that flux, a few things became very clear to me. First of all, based on the example of my mom and the fact that my children didn't have an alternative mother, my children would always be first priority. The other thing was that while I completely understood how people um, would like to be stay-at-home moms, I loved my work. I really loved my work and I wasn't going to stop that. So I had to find a way for work and life to properly integrate because this, this needed to work for me. What really helped was that my mom would always tell me, don't worry, you're doing fine, just do you. Don't, don't worry about what anyone is thinking or saying. So that was great. So my parents were also really good grandparents. And every holiday, um, my kids, when they were smaller, would go um, and stay there for three, three or four days. Now, in addition to being spoiled rotten and being thoroughly overfed, when they were leaving, um, she'd want to bake for them and she'd ask them what flavor they want. Please note these are six children. And so they'd all pipe in, sure, sure, I want banana bread, sure, sure, I want chocolate cake, I want vanilla, whatever it is. And you know she'd make six cakes, right? She was an usher at church for the longest time. And we recently found out that actually she's been baking cakes for their children and their grandchildren. Um, she was also that auntie that everyone just completely loved. And, and that, that was just really my mom. She also gave blood until at 65, they told her, you can't come back anymore, go away. We don't take blood from people who are over 65. And then she started to change. So my mom was the fastest, most careful driver that I knew. And now she was having minor accidents that just didn't make sense. And then before Google Maps, if you really wanted to know all the back routes that there were in this city to avoid traffic, she was the one you'd ask. And now she was getting hopelessly lost in places she should have been familiar with. She was in Bible study fellowship for more than 20 years, BSF, and now she couldn't find books in the Bible. So obviously something was wrong and we took her for a checkup and physically she was completely fine. She also did that test that um, Trump keeps saying he aced and she also aced it. But we still knew there was something wrong. And so um, at the suggestion of a doctor friend of mine, she went to see a neurologist and she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. So what does this general's daughter, Miss Fix-It, numbers girl logic do? Kick into action. We're going to fix this, right? So first of all, I moved her nearer me. I found her a full-time carer. And then as far as I knew at the time, if you keep the brain active, you're going to stop this. So 
I checked into all of that stuff. She had a newspaper delivered every day. I found her books to read. I found our BSF group close by because um, BSF also has homework, which meant in addition to the BSF um, session, she'd also have homework. And then I also became that horror daughter who'd be checking, have you read today? Have you done your BSF homework? And all of that. Then I continued to read about Alzheimer's because I wanted to see how best to help my mom. See, Alzheimer's is this crazy disease where um, the wiring in your brain just goes haywire. And after a while, some of those connections just die. Alzheimer's has no cure. And your brain just continues to deteriorate. Then I also found out that um, when you have Alzheimer's, when you read something, by the time you flip the page, you actually can't remember anything you just read. And also that when I talk to my mom, she only retains 10 to 15% of what I just told her. So I had to stop. I had to stop harassing my mom. I had to stop insisting that she's reading. I had to stop because there was nothing I could do. Absolutely nothing I could do. There's no feeling like that helplessness of there's nothing you can do. I've watched my mom's memory continue to deteriorate. And now she's even starting to ask us um, whether we spoke to daddy today and what time he's coming home in the evening. <sighs> it's, it's, it's so hard, I miss my mom. I miss who she was. I miss having long conversations about anything and everything. It's been really heartbreaking losing my mom while she's still here. So I guess at some point, um, my brain and my heart finally um, understood that there comes a time that all you can do is give back um, in big measures for someone who's given you so much your whole life. I guess no matter how devastating it is, it's a second chance to give, for me to give love unreservedly to my mom and expect absolutely nothing in return. All that's left is to love. <laughs>